He is going to expose the hindrances in your life that are preventing you from functioning at the new level. Now that is not a pretty thing, but it is a very beneficial thing. It's a sign that he wants to take you into deeper waters in ministry. So instead of you being discouraged this morning, instead of you beating up yourself and say, woe is me, you should actually step back and say, what is this issue that he's dealing with? And why is he dealing with me at this time with this issue? Now is his time to deal with that. If you've got your Bible today, would you turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 17. One verse this morning. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. So this is part three of our series, God is trying to do something in you and through you. Each of these messages are probably standalone messages. So if you've missed part one and two, uh, don't despair. Uh, this message this morning, even of itself, um, is a new message. Um, we started looking at this subject two weeks ago, and I want to look again this morning at the twofold work that God is trying to achieve in you. Um, that is, God is trying to do something in you, but he's also trying to do something through you. So we're trying to establish what that is, um, w what is both, and also um, what are the hindrances to both. Um, because if we don't look at the hindrances, then we could end up being hindered for the rest of our Christian walk because our flesh got in the way. Um, by the way, isn't it good news this morning that God wants to work in you and through you? You know, if that's just where we pitched our tent this morning, if that was the only revelation that you got this morning, you should leave this place encouraged. That God Almighty wants to actually work in you. Despite all your failures, your shortcomings, God wants to work in you and through you. What a blessing this morning. And that's so humbling for everybody that's here today. But it's so important that we establish an absolute at the beginning of this message. The main obstacle for God working in you and through you is your flesh. Your flesh is the natural you. Um, it's your personality outside of Christ. It's so selfish, subtle, and seductive, your flesh. I'm sorry if I'm offending you this morning, but um, if you have a revelation of your flesh, I'm sure you would say amen. Amen? amen. amen. You can blame whoever you want and whatever you want, but you're missing the main problem in your life if you don't get this subject this morning. Um, before you defend your flesh in any way, or justify his actions, please know your flesh has the ability to sink to the lowest depths. I'm not talking about your neighbor this morning. I'm not talking about anybody else but you. And I'm talking about me. Would you agree? I mean, it can think the vilest thoughts, feel the most corrupt emotions, speak the cruelest words, and perform the most perverse deeds. There is absolutely nothing good or wholesome in your flesh. Nothing. It is an enemy of God. And it is an enemy of your spiritual growth. As Christian writer Stephen Mansfield um, wrote. Every Christian has a capacity for the, the most magnificent Christ-likeness. Yet. Every Christian also has the potential to commit the most disgusting and horrible acts of the flesh. Can anybody relate to that today? The, just the, 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 sometimes the, the diversity and the extremity of what goes on inside of a human being. I'm not even talking about the world this morning. I'm talking about us, God's people, because we're the only ones who can be Christ-like. They have no ability to be Christ-like out there. 
those that are unsaved. When a person gets born again, this nature fights the new man who is alive unto God. Before that, before you were saved, there was no conflict. Um, because there was one resident in the house and he was unchallenged. Amen? It, it's easy in some sense for the ungodly because there's no constant conflict between the spirit and the flesh. But without, within us, we have a constant everyday conflict going on. It's unrelenting. Yesterday's victory is no good for today. It might help us today, but I'm saying that today's battle is, an, is a new battle that has to be overcome. Would you agree with that? Um, so, I want to say this morning, never trust your flesh or let him get comfortable. Um, I would like to briefly look at some of the main influences that mold your flesh. And I'm going somewhere this morning, so please be patient. Um, I touched this um, briefly last week. DNA. There's a lot that we take from our natural DNA of our parents. Be aware, we have no choice over our DNA. Would you agree? I mean, there's some things in life we have a choice over. But your DNA, you do not have a choice. You get what you get. Amen? It comes with the territory of being born into this sinful world. Um, but be aware, your DNA is not random. Your personality is not random. You know, your characteristics, your features are not random. Would you agree? Yeah. Stick with me. Um, your DNA is providentially ordained of God. The family that you're born into, your personality, a lot of things, there's the influences around you, uh, especially whenever you're at a tender age, are out of your control. Um, just looking at Casey's baby this morning, just just realizing that baby is so dependent upon mommy and daddy. Huh? Did that baby choose the family that it was born into? Did it have any influence over it apart from just being born? So what I'm saying is, please be aware of this subject of DNA. You get what you get when you're born. That doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with the consequences of it as you start to mature. Um, so the family traits that you have inherited have been ordained by God. But you probably realize by this stage that there are many family traits that are not good. Amen? Amen? Some of the things that really wind you up and some of your family members is probably in there hidden innately in you. Um, there are things you struggle with that your ancestors also struggled with. There's things that you struggle with this morning that your siblings struggle with. That's because you carry the same corrupt family traits. So, I've given DNA a hard enough time. Um, so, would you agree that that's something that can mold your character, your DNA? Another thing um, that molds your DNA and your, your flesh is personal experiences that you go through. If you're not careful, life can really mess you up. Life. Regardless of your DNA, life itself has an ability of absolutely crushing you. Get a few unexpected punches at the wrong time and you could be wobbling. You can think that you're strong. You've got all your ducks in a row. Boom. Life throws you a curved ball and before you know it, you're on the ropes. Your mental and your emotional state can be majorly affected by life. Many, by the way, become victims of life. There are is a lot that we take from per the personal experiences of life. After all, um, some of it we have choices with, other stuff, we, it just comes across our path. 
Now, if we do not overcome these unique tests and these unique trials that we encounter, we could literally all become victims. If we don't identify that this experience that we're going through and the effect that it's actually having on us, we could be in a real bad shape. For example, if we have been hurt and not dealt with it, then there could be underlying bitterness in our heart. Remember this, hurt leads to bitterness. Bitterness leads to anger. Anger leads to vengeance and unforgiveness. And vengeance leads to murder. And Jesus kind of exposed it for us. You don't need to go out there and put a bullet in somebody's head to be a murderer. Would you agree? We simply just have to have hatred in our hearts toward another human being. And we qualify in God's eyes for being a murderer. I think we're allowed to hate the devil though. Amen? Anybody agree with that? Okay. By the way, and I just mentioned one thing there because we all experience hurt. Okay? We don't all deal with hurt the same way, but we all experience hurt. Would you agree? But there are a hundred things that I could mention here that could be relevant this morning, but we could spend the whole morning on these. A hundred things that we can experience in life that absolutely mold our character if we're not careful. What about the influence of others? Amen? The influence of other human beings can mold our DNA or or, our our Fleshly characteristics, by the way. Uh, We have a habit of mimicking those who we know, those who we respect, and those that we admire. Uh, We are influenced by the behavior of others more than we actually realize. Um, I remember waking up... um, one Sunday morning, and I had a real raw, sore throat. And I'm like, I have to, I'm going to have, I have to preach today. And I felt my throat was like on fire. It was just raw. So um, I started to, well, I, I got lukewarm water and I put salt in it. And this is what I've, I mean, it, it tends to work for me. And I just started to gargle, and you gargle my throat, and then I would spit it out in the sink. Then I would go and I went on. I got I had a big amount of water because I was determined nothing's going to stop me preaching. Well, it wasn't long before I looked at Daniel. Daniel was only about three at the time or four, and Daniel was doing the exact same thing. The only thing is he was gargling all over him, and it, it was. And I'm like, talk about mimicking. Do you understand? I mean, I didn't say right, Daniel. It's your turn to gargle. I know you've got a sore throat, but he just started to do it. And I'm just letting you know that we are we all underestimate how people watch us, observe us, and then mimic us. And anybody that's a parent knows that. Um, most people accept that you become like those you get around. Would you agree? Um, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, and... I'm, I'm quoting it literally in the original because the King James doesn't really, I feel, do it justice. Evil companionships or bad company corrupts good character or good manners. Let me say that once more. Evil companionships or bad company corrupts good character or good manners. Does that make sense? I mean, that's a biblical truth. Many are the way they are because they followed the example of others. Um, This is another sober and timely reminder for all of us that we need to be careful how we talk and how we act. Amen? I mean all of us. Um, We we think it doesn't make a difference, but it does make a difference. Amen? We all fall short here. Amen? Our flesh is so subtle. 
I mean it. So, another thing that influences our flesh is the lies and temptations of Satan. The lies and temptations of Satan um, are there. Our flesh responds to that. In fact, in fact that's what the devil targets. Um, this is the area of you that the enemy targets when he tries to bring you down. He knows your flesh is open to his influence. If your spiritual man is not on his A game, you can find yourself running with a lie or becoming that lie. Amen? Amen. If you're not careful, the devil just plants a little thought. And your flesh has the ability to take it from that to that like within seconds. The devil also wants to try and define you who you are and what you do. Um, He'll have you imagine all types of crazy stuff. Like, the, the thing is, we probably don't go and tell people what really, a lot of stuff that's going on in our mind. Amen? Because they would think we need to get into the, the funny farm right away. Amen? I mean, seriously, like, the mind can just go a hundred directions on just something even innocuous. Um, also, because the devil is a tempter, he wants to snare you with whatever sin appeals to your flesh. So what appeals to you mightn't appeal to your spouse. What appeals to your spouse mightn't appeal to your children or your brother or sister in Christ. So be aware the tempter is always working on your flesh. He has you profiled. He knows your weaknesses. He knows when you are most vulnerable. Okay, so I've said all that to say this. I'm sure you would agree your spiritual man has a lot to contend with. Yeah. Amen? Amen. I, I'm just we're just touching a little bit of what your spiritual man has to deal with. Change doesn't come easy. Um and before we go any further, I would just like to say this. And it might be a good time just to caution us. If we are not careful, we can miss the enormity of what God is doing by blaming others, blaming circumstances, or blaming the devil when in fact God is looking you to blame your flesh. That's where the victory begins, recognizing the real problem. So if you're in this house this morning and you recognize that the main problem in your life is you, then you are in a good place to actually receive the answer. Okay, so that brings me um, to counteracting your flesh. The main aim of the Holy Spirit, when He comes in to reside within you, is to expose your character and the ugliness of your flesh. He wants to reveal that to you. The next aim of the Holy Spirit is to give you power to subjugate your flesh. Okay? So he needs to show you your flesh. This is exactly who you are. And then he gives you the power to actually confront it and overcome it. And I'm going to make a big speak here. The Lord loves you too much to leave you the way you are. The Lord loves you too much to leave your flesh unchallenged. And I can tell you, the longer you go on this Christian walk, you actually are blessed to know that He cares. Aren't you glad that He doesn't let you be yourself? He won't let you away with it. I'm talking about the real McCoy, the genuine believer, cannot get away with it. They can try and get away with it, but they can't get away with being themselves. Because that's not what the Holy Spirit is into. The Holy Spirit does not like your flesh. And if you have the Holy Spirit within you, then you will not like, let your, like your flesh. In fact, you'll hate your flesh. And you'll love your spiritual man. So it's a, 
this subject actually shows you whether you're born again or not. If you love your flesh or if you entertain your flesh to the degree where, well, that's just who I am and I don't care what anybody thinks, you're in dangerous territory. But the genuine believer hates that that fleshly nature that always wants to rebel against God. So, here's the challenge. God wants to change us. But God equally knows we do not change overnight. We do not become a perfect resemblance of Jesus Christ overnight. Um, it takes years of deep internal and external work. It's a lifetime experience. This lifetime journey is called sanctification. Paul the Apostle testifies in Romans 15, 16 that we are being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. You're not sanctifying yourself here. That's legalism. Legalism is a whole load of rules. If you do this and if you do that and if you do whatever, then you're a holy person. But a holy person is someone in whom Christ lives. He's our holiness. Amen? So sanctification is not an event. It's a process. It's a lifetime process of change. But it's also a progressive work. It's progressive. We should be getting smarter, wiser, and stronger the longer we walk this walk. Amen? So sanctification is not a perfect work, but it is a progressive work. And if you're writing notes, you might want to write that, that sanctification is not a perfect work because we never we never get to the stage where we've overcome completely. But it is progressive. We're not what we could be, but we're not what we used to be. Can anybody relate to that? Amen? Okay, so be encouraged. It takes time. Sanctification is not a small subject. Um, and the reason it is a process is we're slow learners. There's times we get it, and then there's times we don't. There's times we have a revelation of God's truth, but we're just struggling to implement it. Do you ever find that? You know that you know in here that something's wrong, but you'd say it or you'd do it anyway. Who can relate to that this morning? Okay, maybe I should say, who can't relate to that this morning? Huh? So, in case you haven't realized, your flesh does not want to change. Um, we love our sin. Um, within our deceitful hearts, we justify our sin. We fight the exposure of our sin. Um, so, God has to take us on a journey. God has to take us on a journey so that that teaches us to see sin the way He sees sin. Are you with me this morning? This is deep stuff, by the way. This is very deep stuff. And if you've got ears to hear this morning, you should actually be encouraged and strengthened because even though this message is cutting me apart, like as I'm preparing it, I'm also getting encouraged as well. So don't ask me to explain that, okay? It's just, if you're spiritual in here today, you can identify with that. One thing that I would recommend to everybody in here, and it's something I've tried to do over the years that's helped me on this subject. I've tried to get close friends around me that not just love me, but also tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Um, you know, carnal people are the opposite. They get people around them that tell them what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. Does that make sense? But I'm just, I'm saying, th that's a nugget this morning. Get people around you that are going to call your flesh out when your flesh po pops its head up. I would say that is love and truth in operation. The Bible says to preach the truth in love. It's not about whenever you see your brother or sister feeling, you're going, there you are. There's, a, there's an example that you're a dirty, stinking hypocrite. 
You shouldn't be doing that because honestly, for every finger you're pointing at your brother or sister, there's three pointing back. Amen? But what I'm saying is when you see a brother or sister deviating off, you should say, hey, I, I need to share this. And I'm, I need to share this because I love you. I, I think I think what you're doing there is wrong. I, I, I think it's hurting you. I think, I think that person that you're running about with is harmful to you. I, I think that habit that you have needs to be broken. Do you understand it? That's love. And I, I, what I'm saying is we need to be, I think we need to be real with each other, but if you really care, then you're going to call it out. If you don't care, you'll just let it go. Does any of this make sense? You know, I'm telling your story and my story this morning. And it's very sobering to even touch this subject. God doesn't just reveal the sin that is an offense to him and which is destructive to our spiritual growth. He causes us to be enlightened about it by taking us through whatever it takes to see it. The more prideful and stubborn you are, the longer it takes. The humbler and more cooperative you are, the quicker it takes. You choose. The genuine Christian hates their flesh and wants a victory over it. They want it purged from their life. Um, but in this journey that God takes you on, could I give you another nugget this morning? Be important or be sensitive to the timing of when things happen and the nature of things that happen to you. That's because God tends to work on one thing at a time. Now, not only does he know that we're slow learners, but he also knows we're kind of thick. Amen? Amen. We're, we're kind of... Would you agree? We're slow learners, but also when we do learn, we're a bit like... He, he really needs to slap us in the head sometimes and say, like, waking up. Um... So he'll bring one thing at a time because if he hit us with ten things, we couldn't handle it. If he, if he's, would you agree? I mean, if he's hitting ten major things in our life, it would just overwhelm us, and we'd just go, "I can't even go to church here. I'm just a, I'm a loser." So I, I feel, and I'm just, I'm sharing what I see in Scripture because I watched, I, I've watched how God dealt with Peter, and in one situation. God's dealing with Peter's faith or lack of faith. Then you're looking at him later and God's dealing with love. There, you're, dealing with, you're looking at him in another situation and he's dealing with discipline. You look at him in another situation and God's dealing with his tongue. And it's like, I feel that that's our story. And when if you look at, you follow somebody like Peter or Samson or anybody, you see that the Lord is just dealing, why did God not deal with the whole thing right away? Because Samson was just like you. Peter was just like you. We, we can't handle it. We're just, we, we, just, we just can't handle it. So he graciously and mercifully takes us by the hand and says, right, you need to deal with that. And he keeps on until we deal with it. And if we don't deal with it, it starts to get pretty ugly. Until he causes us to get it. So what, what I'm trying to tell you is that be mindful when you're reading the word of God how he dealt with his servants in the word. And who can testify to the fact that God is gracious? Amen. Who can testify that he's very gracious with you? Hallelujah. Huh? Amen. Okay. So this subject this morning is not a preacher pointing at you. This is a preacher pointing at himself. And also pointing at you with the word, not, not with anything else. And just telling our story. I'm telling your story this morning. I'm telling my story. But here's good news. And I want you to listen what I'm about to say. Because this is so important. Normally, when God is about to take you to a new level of revelation and responsibility, he cranks up the heat. He is going to expose the hindrances in your life that are preventing you from functioning at the new level. 
Now that is not a pretty thing, but it is a very beneficial thing. It's a sign that he wants to take you into deeper waters in ministry. So instead of you being discouraged this morning, instead of you beating up yourself and say, woe is me, you should actually st step back and say, what is this issue that he's dealing with? And why is he dealing with me at this time with this issue? Now is his time to deal with that. And instead of just, well, it's his fault, her fault, that thing, blah, 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 my mom and dad were like, blah, blah, all that nonsense. Shut up. Just realize that it's God's time to deal with that issue. So it might be a good time in the message to ask this question. Is there something that he's dealing with you at the moment that is preeminent, that is major, and it won't go away, and you know that he's bringing this to your heart, not to beat you up, not to discourage you, but to take you to a new level? Is there something that you're not dealing with, but it's part of you and you know you don't like it, you know God doesn't like it, and where he's taking you, you're going to have to change. Is there something in your life that you know is toxic and it's major and it won't go away? And every time you come into a service like this and a subject like this is covered, there it is straight in front of you. The preacher didn't even mention it. But the Holy Ghost is saying, this issue must be addressed. And that's why I didn't deliberately mention a hundred things that could be an obstacle in your life. I give one example because it was something that's very much prevalent in every one of our lives. What is that issue? Because if he's dealing with it at the moment, obviously there's a reason why. God shows you the deceitfulness of your heart, the ignorance of your own mind, the ugliness of your own character, the foolishness of your own agenda, the toxicity of your own words and shortcomings of your own behavior because he loves you. Whether you cooperate or fight God on this is your own choice. God is a very personal God. He's very personal. I'm telling you, he knows what your spouse doesn't know. He knows what the preacher doesn't know. He knows what you don't know. I'm telling you, the scary thing is there's things within our life that at the moment we're ignorant of. God's not putting his finger on it at the moment, but next week he could be putting his finger on it and it's like, wow, that preacher's taking a dig at me. And it's like, no. The preacher doesn't even know. The Holy Ghost knows. And it's like, okay, you dealt with that. We're on to a new subject now. This is a new area of growth. Isn't that lovely the way the Lord works? Sanctification is a progressive, it's a gradual, progressive work. And if it wasn't that there, honestly, we, we just, we couldn't handle it. There's nobody in this house this morning could handle it. Okay, so I'm getting to where I need to get to this morning, okay? So I've got my introduction out of the way. Okay. <laughs> By the way, th this is a deep subject. So uh, there's a lot of this here, honestly. I, we, we can't avoid this. If we need to get to where we need to get to, we need to go through this to get to it. But when God created us, we all know we were created imperfect. We were born with Adam's blood in us. We were born with indwelling sin. And thankfully, he gave us something, someone to counteract that, which is the Holy Spirit. So in Jeremiah chapter 18, 4, it says this. We're talking about the potter and the clay here. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel. Uh, and listen to this. As seemed good to the potter to make it. So this part of sanctification is God making you the way that he wants to make you, not the way that you were born. So the clay was born marred, so he started to make it all over again. So in the new birth, the, the potter is starting to mold this vessel into something that is pleasing to him. 
That's what it says in Jeremiah 18.4. Please know we're marred clay. But thankfully, he doesn't discard the clay. He could say, okay, maybe I don't know what they do today. Um, maybe the, make a vessel, it's marred, throw that in the garbage. Is that, is that what he does? If you listen to legalists, you would think that's the way God deals with his vessels. So deal, there's, a, there's a vessel that's made, it's imperfect, um, it's sinful. God says, I'm done with that. Is that the way God does? Is that what it says here? No, he starts to make it all over again. I want to make two big statements here, and then I'm going to back it up with Scripture. It is not wise to question God. It is not wise to fight God. So let me give you Scripture to back both of these statements up. Romans 9, 20, verses 21, 20 to 21. O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? Is that potent? So would you agree it's not smart to question God? And again, you can see the context here is the potter and the clay. Next one, Isaiah 45, 9. And I'm going to read it in the ESV. For just with being in sympathy with my brother Curtis this morning, because I love him the bits. And, um, but actually, there's a reason why I'm reading it in the ESV. It just, it just to me makes it a little bit clearer. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or your work has no handles. Isn't that powerful? Aren't those scriptures powerful in regard to, you know, I'm here to tell you that the potter has got it all under control. He's working on you. And the junk in your life, he is very much trying to get rid of. He's getting rid of the junk, not you. He's getting rid of it. But when you cooperate with him, then it's a victory. When you fight him, it's an absolute disaster. So, I want to get to this, which is the burning off of the dross. One of the most powerful and repeated illustrations that God uses to demonstrate this deep work within us is the preparing of the silver and the gold in a furnace. He likens our sin and flesh to dross that must be removed from the silver and gold to make it attractive. Um, the main way that God strips us of our sinful, stubborn flesh is by burning off the junk, by putting us through the fire. Who feels over this last couple of years that they've been going through the fire? Anybody here? By the way, even though sometimes we curse the, the fire, sometimes we struggle in the fire, we have to go through the fire. Every genuine believer in history that has achieved anything in this life has had to go through the fire. Um, there's much scripture that likens us to silver and gold been put through the fire. 1 Peter 1.7 says this, The trial of your faith, listen this, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trials that you're going through this morning, the trials that you've been going through over this last few years, are carefully designed, they're carefully timed, and they're carefully measured to accomplish something in you. I know it doesn't feel like it. But you have to be aware that who has their hand on the thermostat. By the way, it's not the devil. By the way, it's not your enemy. Think about that. Sometimes it feels like that, but it's not. God has got his hand on the thermostat. 
God in the midst of that fire is not only trying to burn stuff off, but he's trying to enlighten you to his truth. He's trying to reveal his own character and provoke a spiritual response in you. Um, you see, when God brings a trial into your life, they're not directed to where you were or where you will be. Your trial is directed to where you are because God knows. God knows exactly today where you are. So what you're going through today is, is properly prepared. Um, and I think we know this. The only way that Christ can be seen in us is when we get out of the way. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get us out of the way. Um, he has to burn away our stinking thinking. He has to burn away our bad habits. He has to burn away the harmful influences in our life in order to make us use, useful or usable. The Lord says in Isaiah 48, 10, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. I know that I've had to go through many situations that I feel like it's touch and go if I'm ever going to make my way through it. Have you ever been there? Where it's like, I don't even know whether I'm going to come through it today or this week or this year. I hope I make it to the end of the year, but sometimes it's so intense, it's so impactful, you're literally thinking, am I going insane here? Or is this going to overwhelm me? Is this going to destroy me? Have you ever felt that? That it's literally, this is too much. It feels like it's too much. But it's not too much because how do we know it's not too much? Because we know who's in control. What's that? We're not dead. <laughs> That's a really good answer. I need to put that down there. <laughs> we know it's not too much because we've still got a heartbeat. Huh? But we know it's not too much because we know who's actually in control of it. Remember, he says that he'll not put anything upon you that, there's, that, that would overwhelm you to the stage where there's not a way of escape. So if it was going to absolutely be too much, I believe he would give you an exit. Because he cares. Because he loves you. Because he's on your side. He's on the side of his people. He's, he loves us. And so he doesn't do this because he just hates us or because he wants to punish us, he does it because it works. Amen. The fire works. Amen. It actually works. He's been at it for years and it works. I know when I always come out the other side, I always feel a little bit lighter. It's like, wow, wouldn't want to go through that again, but <laughs> I'm glad that chapter's closed, but Thank you, Lord, for just doing something with me in the midst of it. Amen. And sometimes the enormity of the work is not seen until later. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, this is what was accomplished in that. And little do you realize it's only a few years later that you realize that's what was accomplished. Mm -hmm. Because we only see a little bit of the picture. Mm -hmm. The deeper the work, the hotter the fire, normally the greater... Uh, responsibility or fruit that's coming down the road. But that junk can't be taken with you to the next chapter. That junk needs to be left in this chapter. This chapter is a new chapter with new challenges, new opportunities, but also that is not in vain because you can then come into this chapter with experience and say, I know what you're going through. Or I used to struggle with that thing as well. But you see in that chapter and the chapter before and the chapter before that and the chapter before that, I did not pass the test. In fact, I messed up in every chapter. But in this new chapter, all I can say is I've learned. And sometimes you see Paul saying things like I have learned. I have learned. The only way you learn is through experience. You know, 
I think we can learn, obviously, by study. Would you agree? But the greatest learning you will do is through experience. Whenever you come to the other side and you say, I know. That's why when you watch Peter, like Peter, Peter didn't even want the Lord to go to the cross. Lord, you can't go there. This, there's no way. And whatever. And oh, I'll never deny you. I don't care if every single person denies you. I'll never deny you. What did he do? Huh? Do you know how the Lord dealt with it? With one look. One look. So you imagine the Lord is sitting sitting there accused at the front with all these religious vultures accusing him. And Peter just denied him for the third time. Obviously he had... He, he, he had a sight of the Lord there. And the Lord looked at him. And you know what? He ran out crying like a baby. The Lord didn't even open his mouth. The Lord didn't even open his mouth to Peter at this stage and say, Peter, you're out of order. There you go. I told you. I told you that you were going to deny me three times. All the Lord did was looked at him. But because Peter was a real McCoy, that's all it took. And I'm telling you, sometimes all the Lord has to do is look at us and we drop our heads and go, oh, Lord. But um, the, actually the word there for crying or weeping, was it's the, the strongest form of crying. You know, there's some, there's some yeah, he, 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 he wept bitterly. Bitterly. Because of what he had done. He denied his Lord. And It's hard to believe it when God's on you. There's nothing compares to when God's on your case. It's because you know that you know that you know you've done wrong. But this same Peter became one of the most potent instruments that ever lived on planet Earth. He, he led the disciples into the greatest revival in history. This same man. Isn't the Lord gracious? That's why Solomon cried in Proverbs 25, 4, Take away the dross from the silver, and there shall come forth a vessel for the refiner. Dross here is a picture of sin. It represents everything that is abhorrent to God. Job testified in Job 23, 10, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, what? I shall come forth as gold. Is that lovely? You see, the longer you go on, you start to realize what's going to come out of this is something special. Once the dross is disappeared, then what's going to be seen is Christ Jesus. Back a few years ago, there was a black sister who was going through the fire. She was really troubled. And she went, she approached her pastor and she said, I'm going through the fire, pastor. He started to rejoice and he did a dance. This was down south. He, re, he started to dance and rejoice and whatever. And he said, praise the Lord, sister. Hallelujah. And she looked at him as if he was crazy. She was confused by his response. He says, pastor, I don't think you're understanding what I'm saying. Um, I'm going through the fire. So what did he do? He started doing another little dance. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, sister. That's great to hear that. Amen. So he says, you don't understand me. He says, I do understand you. He says, you told me you're going through. You're going through the, the fire. The fire's not going to burn you up. And she suddenly got what he was saying. Remember the three in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Would you agree the enemy, the enemy put them in there to punish them? The thing is, they did that, but there was four in the fire. Um, 
There was a fourth man. The Lord Jesus, I believe, joined them in that fire. One like unto the Son of Man. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. And I want to say this because I know time's shooting on today and I want to come to a close here. There's a lot of times that we're praying for God to take us out of the fire. When God is actually trying to bring us through the fire. There's a lot of other times that we're praying that God will take us out of the fire when he's actually looking to join us in the fire. Okay, so there's, t- there's, there's times that we pray that God will take us out of the fire when he's trying to take us through the fire. There's other times we pray that God will take us out of the fire and he's actually looking to join us in the fire. Does that make sense? So it's, what I'm saying is the spiritual man will understand that. Because always, we, we don't want to go through the fire. You know, if, if we were to do a Q&A here and just ask everyone to be honest what fire they're going through, uh, would you, do you really want to be going through that? Do you think you should be going through that for a year or two years or five years? Like, if we were brutally honest, none of us would say yes. But when we come through the fire and look back, most believers will, will look back and go, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I didn't appreciate it at the time. It did not feel good at all. But I am a stronger person for that because I'm more like you. There was a lot of me that had to be burnt off through that trial. And I'm glad I went through it now. But at the time, did we enjoy it? So as I close here, I just want you to consider that worst scenario, as a believer, when you go through the fire, you have to see there's a reason for it that God has to address the flesh. The flesh cannot remain, it can't be unchallenged, or else we would self-destruct. We would literally self-destruct. So the, the trials of life and the tests of life can be harsh. They can even be painful. They can be prolonged. They can be lonely. They can be hurtful. But as a believer, you know that all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are the called according to His promises. And I'm telling you, when you know that, it doesn't necessarily make it easy, but it makes it easier. I'll say that again. When you know that as a revelation, it doesn't make it easy, but it makes it easier. So, pointing the finger at God is foolishness. But coming to God saying, I don't know why I'm going through this, but will you help me make it through? I believe that that is a genuine, a, a wholesome prayer to pray. I don't believe that th- that's question of God when you say, Lord, I don't know why I'm going through this, but please, will you take my hand? Will you join me in the midst of this? Because I don't want to be destroyed. I'm here to reflect your character. I'm here to make a difference. And maybe the trial you're going through at the moment is because there's a new door opening. A new level of ministry that you have never, ever experienced before. But because that door is about to open, the Lord's saying, that stuff is not going to this next level with you. You must leave it here because that door will only swing open when you deal with that. Let us pray. I'm sure you would agree there's not a subject that comes closer to home than this subject. Because it's talking about who we are, where we're coming from, where we're going. I just simply want you to ask a question in your heart this morning. Just what is the Lord dealing with as as we have covered this? I'm not asking for anyone to raise their hand. I'm just simply asking you to reflect upon what we've spoke about. Is there something there that you can't shake off? You know 
that through this season, he's trying to deal with that. If you're a believer, he's, he's dealing with something. If you're here this morning and he's not dealing with anything, then honestly, I would question your salvation. You're just full of yourself. You're full of pride. And you, you, you need to get born again. But if you are a believer, God will be dealing with something in your life. What that is, honestly, what that actually is, is very personal to you. Nobody might even know what that, that battle is. And maybe nobody even needs to know what that is. But he knows. And he, he's not happy with it. You know, my battle this morning is different from yours. Maybe we may have a similar battle. But I'm saying our journey is so unique. I would encourage you, instead of fighting him, just throw the hands up and just say, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I'm the clay. Father, would you just help us, Lord, to be pleasing unto you. Would you just help us this morning to be Christ-like. Lord, we acknowledge that we do fall so short at times. We, we fall so easily for the lie of the devil. We get so easily influenced by those around us. And we, Lord, we, we even default to our own fleshly DNA. Sometimes we're more similar to our unsaved relatives than we want to be. But Lord, we don't want to be like them. We want to be like you. But we can't be like you unless you help us to be like you. Because the flesh cannot change the flesh. And the spiritual man can only change and overcome the flesh with the help of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, would you come today into every life and just help us to be what we're meant to be and do what we're meant to do. In Jesus' name, amen.